Hi, Lenny. Hi, Nancy. Welcome to episode 45 of the Front Porch Book Club. The Front Porch Book Club is a podcast that meets twice a month. We like to dig deep into the relationship between characters and the worlds they live in. Grab your book and iced tea and join us on the Front Porch. Well, Lenny, it's January, the time of New Year's resolutions. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> we thought it would be fun to have a goal setting and achievement book for January since this is the month that many people make New Year's resolutions. <laughs> right. So our book is called Max Out Mindset by Dr. Larry Widman. In Max Out Mindset, Doc, that's what we can call him, Doc. Yeah introduces the 15 powers that will improve your mindset to achieve more in business, sport, and life. Larry shares his experience as a psychiatrist who loves research and as an athletic performance consultant loves results and he gets good results. Yeah, Larry brings in stories of his own life and the lives of elite performers that he has worked with. Yeah, this is the first time we've had a self-help book on the front porch. So I'm looking forward to talking through with you some of the science-based concepts that Doc introduces. So let's get to it. Okay, Nance. I think this book is right down your alley because the philosophy that undergirds the 15 powers Doc lays out in Max Out Mindset is positive psychology. And this is something I know that really resonates with you. Do you want to talk a little bit about positive psychology and why it's an approach you are excited that he applied in this book? Positive psychology is something that I think a lot about. It's something that resonates with me, both in my personal life, but also professionally in my clinical practice. I use a lot of the components of positive psychology every day. It really looks at catching people doing things right, what brings joy into people, how to improve life satisfaction, concepts like spirituality, mindfulness, being present, meditation, having grit overcoming challenges. It's actually a very wide umbrella, but it's very helpful because people who come in for therapy have big problems and issues. And it just gives a different lens from that lens to looking at what is going right what can we add rather than fixing the problem all the time? This kind of flips it to say what's going well or what can we look at to increase the positive stuff. Mm -hmm. What I like about Maxed Out Mindset is that he takes this really broad umbrella and he really defines bits and pieces of it as it applies to improving mindset and performance in an athlete or a businessman or just people that are out there playing sports and bowling on the weekend. Yeah. So Nancy, positive psychology, what were your overall thoughts about it? Yeah, I'm actually kind of familiar with positive psychology. Might surprise you. It doesn't because <laughs> you're so smart. <laughs> you know all sorts of stuff. My perspective on it really comes from more a business influence perspective. I came out to the University of Nebraska to get my master's degree in business administration, and little did I know it when I came out here, but Nebraska was the birthplace of positive psychology in many ways. Donald Clifton was a professor here, and he founded Selection Research Incorporated, which later acquired Gallup, and he became the chairman of Gallup. He was recognized with a presidential commendation from the American Psychological Association as the father of strengths-based psychology and the grandfather of positive psychology. I didn't study with Clifton. I did attend several lectures that he was still doing at the university at the time. But I did study with Dr. Fred Luthans, who was influenced by Clifton, and Dr. Luthans created the field of positive 
organizational behavior and the concept of psychological capital. And those built on psychological resources of hope, optimism, resilience, and efficacy in the workplace, basically positive psychology in the workplace. So quite a few of my studies had some element of positive psychology here at the university. And of course, since then, I've followed the field as well. Oh, I had no idea all of this was in (laughs) in the business world. I thought this was just a psychology kind of concept. So it doesn't Mm -hmm. surprise me to hear that. And it doesn't surprise me that he can take these concepts too and apply it to business. But I didn't realize that this was all in your MBA program and all of Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. How interesting. Okay. So we're both big fans of positive psychology, obviously. (laughs) Doc introduces two other psychological concepts that are important. The power of space is one and his own four legs of elite performance. The power of space comes from Dr. Viktor Frankl. Okay, now I got to say something about this guy because I read his book. He's a concentration camp survivor. Mm -hmm. And one of the newer concepts from a psychological perspective, existentialism is basically his concepts. Now, he never really set out to be a psychological theorist, I don't think. But we use some of his experience in the clinical practice. I think most people probably do or think of him. Dr. Viktor Frankl wrote, and I quote, between stimulus and response, there is space. And in that space is the power to choose our response. And in our response lie our growth and our freedom. Now, that's very powerful. And when you think of his experience in the concentration camp, and his book is fascinating, he's in what most people would consider a powerless position. Yeah. But in that space, he was still able to say, this is happening around me, and there's a space here. And then how is he going to respond to it? Yeah, I really admire him too. His book is Man's Search for Meaning, a classic many people have heard of. I was really struck by his belief too in that book that it's important for everyone to have a deeper meaning or purpose in their lives and that having that deeper meaning or purpose will help them persevere even in the were circumstances, for instance, his circumstance in a concentration camp. One of the things that he wrote in Man's Search for Meaning was, and I'm quoting, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how, which I really love. It's like, well, what is important in your life? What are you striving for? And in a very small example of this and very minor example of this, I do remember, speaking of getting my MBA, that I decided that I was going to get my MBA. And there were some times during that process that I was burnt out, tired, overwhelmed. And it was just going back to that decision and knowing the why that I was doing it kept me going. What was the why, Nance? It was my curiosity. I wanted to know the concepts that drove the economic side of our world. And it seems very theoretical, (laughs) but that is what I wanted. I wanted to satisfy my curiosity. And so I thought about what I was doing or the circumstance that I was in. And I was like, you know what? No matter what else, this is achieving that and I'm continuing on. Yeah, the why question he talks a lot about in his book too. Yeah. Why are you here? What are your goals? What is the why? And defining that. Why are you wanting to play on the women's volleyball team? What has driven you to this point? Why are you here? So a lot of good questions. If you can start with the why, Mm -hmm. it does kind of channel your frame of thought a little bit. And I remember too, back in grad school, slugging through the papers and the endless reading. You know how much I love that. Yeah. But the why was for me too, 
I want to get this down. I want to learn as much as I can so I can help people. That was the why. Yeah, I'm not surprised that was your why. Speaking of Frankel and the power of space, another thing that Frankel wrote that I really liked, forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing, your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. Boy, there are times that I know that I have had a trigger response to a situation that wasn't good. And it's the recognition of that space and training yourself and building the mental skill to do that, that I think is so valuable. And that also reminds me of cognitive behavioral therapy. Is, is that a part of all of this thinking or is that a separate toolkit? Cognitive triangle is really your mind or your thoughts, let's just say thoughts on one point of the triangle your feelings or affect on the other point of the triangle and your behavior on the other point of the triangle. You'd say, well, where is my issue? Where am I hooked up? Where am I stuck? And then it forces you to look at one or the other two points of the triangle. If I'm stuck at an intense sadness or depression, then what behavior or thoughts can I have to unstick myself? Okay. For me, it kind of makes me think of creating that space for yourself by taking a step back and doing that analysis of where you are. I'm not just going to allow my thoughts to trigger my feelings or my feelings, my behavior or anything in the triangle. I'm going to stop. I'm going to talk to myself about it. And I'm going to make a decision about how I move forward. Right. And all of that it kind of leads us back to the book too, mm -hmm. because he talks a lot about that space and thinking through what is my self-talk? Why am I here? What is going on for the athlete or for anyone? And then restructuring, shaping, those are behavioral terms, but practicing obviously is a, is a big thing for athletes, but taking that space, resetting Goal planning is a huge part of his book. Yeah. Observing behavior is another area that he talks a lot about. But working in that space to help people figure out where are they tripping up or what can they do better in too. Mm -hmm. So there's 15 powers that he talks about in his book, basically three parts to that your mind, your emotions, and your team. He talks a lot about individual sports and things like that, but his major sports that he brings about in the book are these team sports. And people in business can, obviously everybody's a part of a team in business. So the skills that you learn from his book are things that you can put in your everyday life. And he even talks a little bit about, you can use even your family as a team if you want. Mm -hmm. Which of these three parts, the mind, emotions, or team, did you find most interesting, Nance? So much. So much of this book I found interesting. I really like the max out your mind section. And in that section, the powers were the power of high performance mental skills, the power of mindfulness, the power of mindset, and the power of grit. But I also really like the max out your emotion section too. And in that section were the power of happiness, the power of appreciation and gratitude, and the power of vulnerability. Yeah. And that's all positive psychology there. So that's all over that, Nance. <laughs> and so much of it overlaps as well. Right. And he points that out too. But I think I did like the first section, that power of high performance mental skills. That's where I took a lot of notes. He says the four big mental skills are one, goal setting, two, self-talk, three, visualization, and four, arousal control. And those really resonated with me. I like the exercises that followed that chapter. I did the exercises. I'm going to, in the coming year, work around the goals and the process that I put in place. I was really surprised to read that we have 50,000 individual thoughts a day on average. And people, in general, have three times as many negative thoughts as positive thoughts, 
while elite performers have three times as many positive thoughts as negative thoughts. So that whole self-talk issue really resonated with me. And I like that he normalized that we can have a lot of negative self-talk. And he suggested some replacement talk, such as I've got this, or I can, instead of I can't, or just skill prompts like for tennis, loosen my grip on my racket, or eyes on the ball, or whatever. And then under arousal control, just the importance of deep breathing and that visualization and imagery can really improve performance too. Just thinking through the skills and even physically doing the skills, even if you're not out on the court. So all of those things, I just thought he pulled them together in such a really helpful way. I love that whole section. How about you, Lenny? What did you find most interesting? Oh my, I can't even pinpoint anything. I mean, I think everything you said... I find the whole mindfulness and positive psychology thing fascinating. I just love every component of that. I have always been so interested in visualization. And when I see athletes at the top of a mountain on their skis and they are going through every single gate. You can see them going through every single gate or whatever sport that is. You see them using that. And I do believe there's so much power in that. And we'll, we'll take it off the sports thing, because I think this applies in so many different facets of life. But if you could visualize yourself, like we said, we both went to graduate school, walking across that stage. Yep. Having your child say to you, good job, or whatever it is, you are more likely to have a positive outcome. If you can't see yourself doing it, you have a less of a chance to do that. I do believe in writing down goals. I don't know if I ever told you this, Nance, but when I was like 25, I got a notebook and I wrote down goals. I think they were three-year goals. And I wrote those down and I put them in my purse and I looked at them every time at lunch. Wow. And I said, these are my goals. These are achievable. This is what I'm going to make happen in my life. And it really helped me to meet those goals and to make steps in the right direction so that I could grow. So I'm a big believer in writing down goals and looking at them and helping you focus on all of those things. And I am really big on self-talk too. I'm really surprised that athletes that are that good (laughs) and elite have negative self-talk and lack of confidence. He's saying that top people in this country have a hard time (laughs) with being kind to themselves. Of anyone, you should be kind to it yourself. But we feel that we need to discipline ourselves. We berate ourselves. That's not being kind to ourselves. I'm fascinated with those ideas. For me, one of the ways I find that space is through mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I can't go on and on about this book. I love every bit of it, Nance. Okay, so I have a question for you. Have you ever used visualization for a specific skill or in a specific incident? And I will answer the question first, because I totally have. When I've had big presentations that I've had to do in front of like a thousand people, and I've been a little nervous about it, I definitely have spent time visualizing, walking out on that stage, confidently, slowly speaking, breathing deeply. So I've definitely done it in business. And I've also done it recently. I'm trying to improve my tennis serve. And I'll tell you, I am really having a hard time getting all of the mechanics flowing. And I think just about every night before I fall asleep, I think through my serve. I visualize it. Now I am getting better at it. I'm also practicing. I'm taking lessons. 
but I do think that the visualization has helped me. And those are two instances that I have purposefully used visualization to improve my performance. Have you ever done visualization? Oh, yes, I do. But Nancy, we have done some of this before people even really talked about, well, I guess it's been around for a while. But don't you remember when we were in the band, we would do that. We would visualize ourselves going through the entire show in our heads. Wow. I believe in this stuff and I do practice it in different times in different places. I do think about it a little bit in pickleball. Like I have to get my arm up <laughs> right? yes, to do my slam. So yes, I absolutely do. I believe in all of that. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. And actually, our band was pretty elite for that time. We were for the whole region. That was like the whole Northeast. Yeah. We were pretty good. We were elite, weren't we? We were elite. We definitely were a part of that group. Mm -hmm. So anyway, at least for that moment of our lives, <laughs> we were elite. We were elite in a team sport. Not so much in softball growing up. No. Not so much in bowling. No. So, Nance, thinking of this next year, any particular part of the book and having a maxed out mindset that you think that you're going to be using this next year? Yes. I totally did the exercises in two areas. In tennis, my big hobby, my current obsession, and in my writing career. Oh, so for both of them, I'm focusing on the mental skills. For tennis, I'm really thinking that the self-talk, the visualization, and the arousal control will be helpful because I've told you this in the past. Once I get to a match, I tend to freeze up. I get very tight. The match goes too fast for me. I can't keep up. So I really think that the self-talk, the visualization, and the arousal control are three areas that will really help. And then, of course, all of the process things. I do have my lessons. I go to two classes a week on skill development. So I'm doing some of those things as well. But I think in the mental game, that will really help me. Now, what about in writing? In writing, the self-talk will be really good for me instead of like, I'm never going to get this book done. Why do I think I can write a novel? It's more like, I can do this. I am learning how to write a novel. I've already finished writing it. I am now just improving it and making it better. This is something I can do. So I think that that self-talk especially is going to be really helpful for that. So how about you? Any ways that you're thinking of applying some of these concepts? Well, I think like you and my, my little passion right now, mm -hmm. pickleball, because I read this book last week and this week got to play pickleball quite a lot. I have a growing awareness of what I'm putting out there. Okay. I'm very positive to the people that I play with. I'm not surprised. Oh, good job. Oh, that was awesome. And all of that. I'd never say anything negative. I never give advice. I <laughs> no, you would not. But I am more aware of how hard I am on myself. And sometimes my negativity towards myself comes outward. So it's not even negative self-talk. That's one thing. But when you end up putting it out there. Like, how are you putting it out there? Like say, oh, Linda. Okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, those kind of things. Yeah. That's negativity that other people are soaking up. And that's not fair to the people that I'm playing with to be negative or to have them deal with all of that. So I'm working on that. And it's got to start with being kind to myself. Yeah. I was playing with better people a couple of weeks ago and I almost quit because they were better. Mm -hmm. I was the worst one of 30 people there. Yeah. I was at the bottom. <laughs> I've been there too. <laughs> I was at the bottom of this particular group of people I was playing with. Yeah. And I, you know, maybe this will be my last game and I will exit quietly. <laughs> yeah. Clap the paddles and say, good game and, and exit. Yeah. 
but I did it. And that's part of positive psychology is grit. Mm -hmm. The self-talk that I used there was, I've only been playing this game for about six months. They all started here too. And they know what it's like. Yeah. And I'm not going to get better unless I play with better people. Yeah. So I stayed the entire time and I helped put the nets away. Did you feel that was a victory? It was a victory. Yes. I did feel that it was a victory. I'm more likely to do it again because I stuck it out and I didn't put my tail between my legs and walk out. Yeah. (laughs) And my very last match was against my coach, the guy that taught me. And he said, you're getting better. Oh. And I'm so glad I stuck to the very end and got a positive from him too. What I like about the book is that these are probably nothing earth shattering for anyone, but I like the way he categorizes it. I like that, hey, these elite people are struggling with this stuff too. Then maybe rolling out of bed and playing pickleball or tennis or whatever you got going on. It's okay to struggle. Let's just be transparent. That was another word that he used a lot in the book. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk through it and get yourself out of bed and get yourself on and doing something. So I can't say no positives about the book, Nance. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy those stories about the athletes and teams? I appreciated knowing that there were people that have to overcome the same challenges that I do or have the same experiences Yeah, that we're kind of all in this together. They are working to shave, if they're a runner, one one thousandth of a second. Or the serve is this, and they are working to make it that. It's like just the edge, just a little bit. I did like that he gave some examples of athletes who worked really hard but never achieved the glory of some of the other athletes that he talked about. And just the importance of finding joy and meaning in the process. Yeah, well, that's where all of us are, right? I think so, yeah. (laughs) And he wrote the book for the average person. All of us probably want to get better. Like you want to get better at tennis. Yeah. I would like to get better at pickleball. I'm looking forward to meeting Doc and talking more about his book, Max Out Mindset, at our next episode. Are there any specific questions you want to ask him, Lenny? Yes, I do. I want to get better pickleball. (laughs) And I bet you, you want to get better at tennis because we have talked about our sports and the effort that we're putting into it and the playtime and a negative self-talk is one of those things. But in the heat of the game, they're both pretty quick sports. They are. So I'm interested to see if he can help me improve my pickleball game by changing negative self-talk, et cetera. (laughs) I love it. So Nance, we look forward to doing that. And the other real interesting thing here, I think with talking to him is that it's going to be in the new year. Yeah. And so it'll be really interesting. A big part of his book is about goals and improvement and things like that. So I'm interested to hear his thoughts on that too. So stop by the front porch the next time when we welcome Dr. Larry Widman, who we call Doc, because that's what the big athletes do. So that's what we're going to do too. (laughs) He's going to stop by the front porch and talk to us about Max Out Mindset. Thanks for listening, everyone. Our website is frontporchbookclub.com. And just a reminder, you can sign up for our free monthly newsletter on our website. Every month, you'll get handy links to our episodes along with updates of what's going on in our lives and sneak peeks into the things that we've discovered and are doing. Our episodes come out twice a month on the first and third Wednesdays of each month. Nancy, I'll see you next time. Sounds great.